presentation is about a bulletproof roster uh, named Flexi. Uh, Flexi is actually a botnet, a fast flex botnet that supports that bulletproof roasting. But first thing first, um, I'm part of the technical collection and the research team at Mondiant Intelligence. What we do is we collect raw intelligence directly from uh, adversary infrastructure. One of our main uh, way to do that is to emulate botnets. So we reverse botnets, create emulators, and uh, use those emulators to either uh, collect information from command controls or directly from the botnet. Um, what kind of information we collect from that? Uh, obviously, we get indicators, high confidence indicators, because when you have emulator that use the botnet protocol and successfully collect, uh, connect to a, a server using that protocol, that means that that server is definitely related to that botnet. Also, we, we get um, things like web injects. So web injects are small scripts that are injected into browsers to collect um, user credentials. And those scripts also use what we call uh, ATS dot are secondary controllers for to which the intercepted credentials are sent to. For spam bots, what we get obviously are spam templates. That is, whenever um, a new spam campaign is pushed to the bots, usually usually received um, a, a spam template. That is a template to generate uh, emails to send over for the campaign. For other kind of botnets, botnets where um, the owner sells some part of the botnet, that could be a compromised machine. Actually, what it does, it, it sells access. And for that kind of botnet, what we see is usually uh, secondary payloads. For example, when the owner of the botnet sells a bot uh, to another actor, that actor might deploy a stealer, a uh, weak on tool, or one somewhere. This is the kind of activity we can detect via botnet emulation. We also have some dedicated trackers, for example, for bulletproof roster, because bulletproof roster uh, are interesting for us. Um, uh, many botnets use controllers behind bulletproof roster. And that sometimes blurs the lines uh, between the different actors. And if you can track the billet professor and the infrastructure behind, you are able to do a better breakdown over the different actors you see in the different botnets. So to do that, we support about 60 families. Uh, the most famous one are Emotet, Trickbot, Catbot, Selenite. So yeah, about 60. Um, so, what about Flux? So Fluxy is a fast flux botnet that is used as a protection layer to hide the backends. Uh, so it does both um, DNS service that is resolving um, domain names to IPs to that or to that protection layer and content delivery. That is once that domain name must be resolved to the protection layer. The protection layer acts as a proxy between the backend, that is hidden, uh, and the customer or the client. Um, so that, that's a real business. Um, uh, we know about two actors uh, selling the Fluxy service on the underground. One is CC Web. CC Web sells uh, directly the protection layer, that is provides you with a panel uh, to configure your backend and the domain names you want to, to, to point to that backend. And um, it, it sells you that, that service where the protection layer will be configured between the backend and that domain name. Uh, Solhost um, provide a similar service, but directly VPS that is already configured behind that protection layer. Actually, we don't know if CC Web and Sol Host uh, are two handled for the same actor, but we definitely know that both are selling the, the, the service associated to Flexi. 
Um, that amount of money for for a bulletproof oyster is pretty high compared to competitors such as Yalishinda, Brazzers. Uh, thing is, uh, Fluxy really seek for high-end customers, right? customers that can pay that amount of money. Uh, for example, we saw Gun Crab when it was still active, 9mm, Fin11 distribution, um, many carding forums, um, that is for marketplaces where you can buy stolen credit cards or stolen access to stolen credentials. Obviously, for that kind of business, you want to hide your backend. Um, so th this summarizes what I explained. That is, um, when you uh, want to access um, uh, a server that is hosted on Flexi, first thing, you resolve a domain name that is associated to that, to, to that server. Uh, you resolve that domain name over public DNS. Obviously, the public DNS, such as quad 8, quad 1, would uh, forward the request to the associated name server. That name server is actually hosted on Fluxy. Uh, Fluxy would reply with uh, a dozen IP addresses that point back to the Fluxy botnet. Then, for example, if you do HTTP, uh, you would contact that IP address with the associated host and the Fluxy node would forward the request to a backend and act as a proxy between uh, the client and the backend. So it's a fast flex botnet because the IP uh, that are provided by a botnet for a domain name change about every 15 minutes. And that's the same for the name, the associated name server. Uh, actually, there is a, a secondary botnet that is named 13. There are few analyses about the 13 malware. So 13 is actually just a loader that uh, and the 13 botnet acts as an infection pool for Fluxy. So whenever the operators want to replace a Fluxy node because it is bugging or because it got infected, they select the 13 node, check its legit. Uh, running a few tests on it um, and promote it to Fluxy, that is loading the Fluxy binary and uh, mapping the bot ID to production network. We know that both networks are related because they share controllers, so pretty good indicator to, to, to tell that both networks are related. Um, so what we want to do is to collect information from the inf adversary infrastructure here. Uh, so the first thing to do that is to understand how the Fluxy networks communicate with its controller. So Fluxy use uh, what we name DNS beacon. That is, you take the message you want to send to a controller, you encode that into a domain, you append that domain to a master domain, and you send that big domain for resolution of our public DNS. Uh, obviously, the public DNS infrastructure will uh, forward that domain name to uh, the associated name server, and the Fluxy operators typically control either the associated name server or control a gateway between the public DNS exits and the configured name server. So this is not new technology. There are many malwares that use uh, that kind of beacon. However, um, when a malware uses that kind of technology, usually the DNS beacon, that is the domain names, end up on passive DNS databases. Um, and Fluxy operators know that. So they, and they don't want their beacon to they log it into passive DNS. So what they do is that on all DNS requests, they, re they reply with a server fail. Uh, and that, that's, that's a message that tells you that the, the DNS query resolution just failed because uh, the server did not answer. So, so that, that's usually enough for 
to prevent uh, DNS resolution request to be logged uh, in passive DNS. But uh, back in 2013, there was an outage that um, and several uh, public DNS servers um, were failing and resolved all domain names to the to the same IP address. This was documented on TechNet. Um, and one of the Fluxy master was part of that outage. So for a short period of time, uh, all DNS requests to that master actually resolved to a valid IP address and the DNS resolution and uh, on um, passive DNS databases. So that's an example of a um, Fluxy beacon you can find on uh, passive DNS. So that big domain with the random part of the beginning uh, is actually the, the, the message. And the last part, masters.polclabs.com, is uh, a master, uh, a Fluxy master domain. So um, now we have that beacon, and what we want to do is to decode it. So um, that's where it gets a bit more difficult. Um, Flexi binaries use uh, a library, a C++ library that is named CryptoPP. Uh, it's a library where all public key algorithms are encoded or with the same template. That is, they say all coded with the same template, template RSA, elliptic curve, Elgamal. All those public algorithms are encoded with the same template because say most most of them relies on, on the same primitive. Uh, the same cryptographic primitive. And what change is how you do an addition, how you do an exponentiation, how, how you do that, that, that kind of thing. And so that that to reverse uh, that kind of uh, code when all symbols are stripped, you really need to know um, how the different algorithm works. So yeah, I made it for flexing and uh, I was able to identify that Fluxy uh, used Elgamal. So Elgamal is a pretty simple algorithm. So the idea is that you have a field uh, generated by a, a prime and a generator. So here it's three. Uh, your public key is just a number in that in that field that you exponentiate. Uh, that is, you take three and you exponentiate three with um, your private key. You obtain a public key uh, and you use that public key to encrypt the messages. Uh, so obviously uh, it is difficult to uh, compute the private key from the public key because this script logarithm is a difficult operation. However, you, you can notice that public, that public key is pretty small and if you have the right tooling such as Kedo NFS, uh, you can actually compute the, the logarithm and obtain the private key. So this is what I did here. So uh, Kedo NFS is pretty simple to use. Uh, you use a DLP option, put that big number, and it will compute uh, a discrete logarithm. However, and this is a principle of the uh, field seeding, you, you you don't know which base that logarithm is computed from. It is it can be any base. And what we want is the logarithm on base three, three being the generator of the field. So uh, once you have the result from um, KEDO and FS, you just need to divide that result uh, by the log three logarithm that is also provided by KEDO and FS. So that, that if it's just those few lines of Python uh, show how to, to compute uh, uh, the, that final um, uh, logarithm. And you obtain that private key, 5, 8, 6, 4, 5, so on. So once you have that private key, you can decode that message. It, it just, you, you just need to, to decrypt with uh, Elgamal with the provided private key. And what you get is protocol version. Here it's one. Uh, the current protocol version is 12. 
the node IP, uh, that, that is uh, the, the IP address of, of the victim machine. Uh, a few flags that tells you if the machine is a VM, if it is stage one loaded, stage one is uh, the first team binary I told you about before, um, and if it is firewall activated or not. Um, then you get the uptime. The, the uptime is used to, you know, select the nodes that are put into production. If you have a, an uptime that is too short, you in staging acting until your uptime grow enough to, to, to know that the machine is reliable enough to, to be put in production. And finally, the bot ID. So that's the really important part. So I told you about that selection process uh, where you have first team node promoted to Fluxy. When they do that promotion, they record the bot ID as part of the uh, production network, the Fluxy production network. And if you beacon with a random bot ID that I don't know, you generated randomly, you won't get any reply. You won't get any config. You won't get any into the, into the network actually. You really need to use a bot ID that has been selected to be uh, able to receive configuration from the Flex network. So this is why being able to de to intercept first those beacons and to be able to decrypt those beacons is really important when you want to collect information from the botnet. So the what I just presented is, was actually the, the Fluxy protocol until end 2019. In 2019, uh, they released a new binary uh, that I named Fluxy FFP, FFP being a reference uh, in, in the Fluxy binary, and it stands for uh, Fast Flux Proxy. Um, when that deployment of that new version of Fluxy happened, a couple of researchers noticed that and saw that a new FastFlux botnet was emerging. Actually, he, he, and one of the name Catherine gave was um, uh, SandyFlex. And actually, it's really the same botnet. It's just Flexi, where new, uh, new binary were deployed and sees those binary features, new capabilities. Uh, so resulting botnet looked a bit different. Um, so again, what we what, what you have to do when you track adversary infrastructure and there's new deployment of a binary, you, you need to reverse it and to understand again the, the, the protocol. So what they did here is that really improve that enrollment process. You know, I told you about that 13 part where they're promoted uh, nodes to Fluxy, and also you have additional checks on uh, once in production. So um, that that new protocol uh, don't use DNS beacon anymore. Uh, what they do is uh, first they check um, a master domain here, assassin.mo.com, and uh, fetch the associated TXT record. So the record is just a text associated to a domain name and stored on public DNS infrastructures. Uh, and that TXT record is actually uh, an RSA signature. And uh, the, uh, the binary include a hard coded public key. And if that signature match the RSA public key, then go to the padding data. Uh, they could it further. There is an additional RSA for there. Uh, and um, interpret the resulting data as IP addresses. So, for example, on the 512 uh, RSC signature, you have about 12 bytes of binding data. Um, so, once you have decoded the padding data into an IP address, you take your beacon message, you encrypt it with elliptic curve again with the key as coded into the in the sample. Uh, and uh, you send that beacon blindly on any UDP portal, any ICMP ID associated to that IP address. And you do that blind. That is, you send the backend and that's all. You don't expect any reply. 
you don't even know if the packet reached the, the IP address. But if you do that correctly, and if you pass a few checks they'll do on, on, on the node, uh, you will receive a new config with new master domain, new crypto keys, a new DGA seeds, a whole new configuration. Uh, and you do that again. That is, you have a new master, you fetch a TXT record, go to the padding data, they got the padding data, get IP addresses, and again, do blind beacons to those IP addresses or UDP ICMP. In the meantime, so they say, say no control node uh, with that staging configuration, and they will test the node, they will test the bandwidth, they will test the running processes, they will test. Um, uh, that touch devices. Um, so, so that they are sure that that node can be put into production. It is legit, it is okay to, to use. So, if you pass all those stages, so all those tests, and if you do the beacon incorrectly, at some point you would receive a final production configuration from the Flexi network. And this is how you know that binary is completely related to Flexi because. The, the, the source of the of the config would be a, a Flexi sub network. Well, this is, for example, the uh, the RSA signature that is associated to assassin.moon.com, and uh, the uh, RSA public key that is uh, the, the modulus. Actually, that modulus is is weak. That is, you can factor it. Uh, into two primes. Uh, that fact would be important for what's coming next. So, no, uh, what's interesting with that new version of Fluxy is the ways and manage um, um, bots. So you can push configuration to to a bot that is that would include crypto keys. Um, there's a master domains, DG configuration, SSL certificates because uh, the node will act as a, uh, as a as a proxy for content delivery, and that can be over SSL. Um, and you can also push new binaries or send commands, but those need to be uh, signed with much larger um, RSA key. I believe, if I remember correctly, it's a 2048 bits key. So that one, uh, uh, I won't be able to crack. But anyway, uh, but what's interesting there is that all that configuration you can push to a node, you cannot read it back. That is by design, the 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 Fluxy developer uh, made it difficult to to read back the configuration of a node, so that. They know that if they push configuration to a node, themselves they, they cannot read it back. So they know that security researcher won't be able to read information, those interesting information from a node. What you, however, what you can do, uh, what you can read from a node, are process, running process names, no telemetry data to check that the node is okay, uh, attached devices. To check that the node is legit and not, you know, security researcher virtual machine. Um, some statistics uh, and telemetry on the inbound data, that is, uh, what IP addresses um, uh, were client for content delivery or DNS requests. And a bug check. That's that bug check. You, you just send a message and the Fluxy binary would take a memory dump of its. On process and send that memory dump to uh, the controller. The controller being the IP address that was decoded from the um, RSA signature in the binding data. So if you control signature, you would be able to encode uh, an IP address there. And if you trigger a bug check, then you can get a memory dump and read. The, the node configuration. So yeah, it's not easy, but that's the way. Uh, another interesting point with Flexi is its DNS server. 
because it's completely custom. Uh, for example, it supports a subset of uh, DNS records. It has some auto tuning capabilities. That is, um, typically a subdomain would raise up to, to the same IP as the master domain. If you take a.a.a.a.flexi domain, you would get the same IP addresses as the flexi domain. So this is not usual behavior for the NSR, and this is a way to identify flexi domains. Also, similarly, uh, the SOA is auto-generated on the requested domain. So if you do a.a.a.a, .a 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 .a, you get an SOA generated on that B domain, which is completely unusual. Uh, so it's it's a really good way to fingerprint DN, uh, DNS infrastructure supported by Flexi or DNS domains, or the Flexi DNS domains. Um, another interesting feature is uh, they can implement whitelist and blacklist uh, on on the DNS server. So if you're blacklisted, the DNS server won't reply to your DNS requests. Also, they have a masquerade um, list. That is, if you are on the masquerade list, uh, the DNS would reply with other IP addresses, that decoy IP addresses. I, I'm not sure how they, they use that, but yeah, my my belief is that they, they use that to, you know, to blur lines and to make security companies or security researchers think that the, the domain is legit because it does not resort to bad IP addresses. Uh, finally, there is um, uh, a default domain that is configured on all nodes, and that domain is derived from the bot ID. So if you have the bot ID, you can check that the node um, is, uh, is actually live and a flux node. All those can be used to fingerprint flux nodes, uh, also, Fluxy does content delivery, uh, and that's an example of a configuration of a content delivery. So I believe that was a configuration for um, Dreamboard. So all those domains, uh, all those domains used as host for HTTP proxy, uh, would be and the, the data would be forwarded to that IP address on port 80. Uh, that mapping, that Proxy mapping is associated to blacklist. They also use blacklist or whitelist for content delivery. And uh, what you can see, TCP BL hash is actually the hash of the blacklist. And to get the actual blacklist, you need to uh, query a peer flux node for, for the blacklist with the hash. And also, that mapping is actually uh, bound to SSL. And the SSL session is ended on the Fluxy node. That's interesting because the traffic between the node and the backend is actually in clear, clear text. And so the node receives uh, the certificate and uh, the private key for the certificate to do the SSL termination. Um, but they, they, this is just an example. They, they also have other configuration where the, the traffic is actually encrypted end-to-end uh, -end and not point-to-point -point like, like this one. Uh, they have that that protocol that actually looks like Tor uh, protocol when they can, you know, encrypt the traffic at the entry node and decrypt the traffic at the exit node. And in the middle, the traffic is, is encrypted. So if you control the exit node, you would be able to see the, the reply in clear text, and if you control the entry node, you can see the, the query in uh, clear text, which is actually the same as Tor if you control exit there or exit nodes, you can you can see some part of the traffic. Um, and that's all for today. And I hope you liked the presentation. If, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.